My name is William Uricchio. I'm a professor in comparative media studies, and we're going to do like a series of intros. I'm going to introduce the introducer, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Katrina Cizek, who is one of the pioneers in the space of co-creation, especially in the documentary world. Um, most notably, or perhaps not most, but in my world, most notice, uh, notably through the High Rise series, which she did with the National Film Board of Canada. Um, Kat works with us here at MIT in the function of artistic director and uh, co principal investigator of the co creation studio, part of the Open Doc Lab at MIT. So, without further ado, Kat, welcome. Thanks, Lily. I have to pull up Amelia's wonderful bio. <laughs> We're really thrilled to have Amelia as our first um, inaugural Mozilla fellow uh, for the co-creation studio at Open Documentary Lab. It's a pretty amazing fellowship. I think there's maybe 20 or so in your cohort. We were just at MozFest last week in London, uh, meeting the whole group and all the host, host organizations. And it's really uh, a group dedicated to the open web as well as um, trustworthy AI is the way that uh, Mozilla is framing its intervention for, for this year, 2020. But um, it's really our distinct honor to have Amelia with us, and I'll just read her bio, it's um, right here. Amelia Minger Bearskin is our is the 2019-2020 Mozilla Fellow. Um, she is an artist technologist who empowers people to leverage bleeding edge technology to affect positive change in the world. In 2019, she was invited, uh, she was an invited presenter to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's world headquarters in Dharamsala for the summit on fostering universal ethics and compassion. In 2018, she was awarded a MacArthur and Sundance Institute Fellowship for her 360 video uh, immersion installation in collaboration with artist Wendy Redstar, supported by the Google Jump Creator Program. The nonprofit she founded, Idea New Rochelle, in partnership with the New Rochelle's Mayor's Office, won the 2018 $1 million Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge to empower the community to co design their city using her VR AR citizen tool. Amelia's Haudenosaunee Iroquois of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma. She's Deer Clan. And we're really thrilled to have her uh, working on a project called Wampum.codes. Um, and tonight she's going to speak about her work recreating peacemaking technologies of the Haudenosaunee, which is an indigenous confederacy across um, what's called the medicine line between US and Canada. And uh, she is. Um, uh, looking at the tenets of the first constitution, how can citizens today reconceptualize their roles and responsibilities in our democracy? Um, and uh, we're really eager to hear more about this project and also how you came to this point. So thank you so much, Amelia, for joining us. Thank, thank you, you all so much. much. Thank you so much, Kat. I applied for this Mozilla Fellowship just so that I could hang out with Kat, which I think is an absolute amazing dream that I could win it and be a part of the fellowship that uh, and community that Kat has created here at MIT. So I'm just really happy and thankful to be here, and I get to play in the same playground as other people here. So thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry I have a quiet voice, but if you want to come down, it <laughs> could help too. Um, I will try to speak louder, but I just know that I terrible at So um, I'm trying to get into my game state here so I can speak louder. Um, yeah, maybe I'll sing that song. That might help. Oh, that would be great. That would help me get my voice warmed up and you guys can move closer since I have naturally a quiet voice. Um, so this is a song of welcome and goodbye from my tribe, I sent a Yuga from the Haudenosaunee like, Iroquois Confederacy. And this is a song that we sing when we're welcoming by. I think a lot of indigenous cultures have that, right? Like a song that's like, it's hello, it's goodbye, it's all the things, it's because we're friends. You know? um, so here it is. You can imagine an amazing chorus of drummers behind me or not. It's in there. So Kat said, uh, how did I get here? I mean, here I walked with Kat and Claudia, but um, to this very moment, I did a lot of weird and strange things. I'm glad I have friends who've witnessed me along the way, making weird and strange things. 
Um, so what do you do when you meet a new technology? I've created a little strategy for myself because I'm constantly meeting new and stupid and amazing and beautiful technologies. So I like to get to the heart of it, and I think the fastest way to do that is make something stupid, make something playful, make something dreamy, or think about what you would have done when you were a kid. That's kind of like primal step. So this is, uh, some of you today already heard about my stupid hackathon. Um, JS, I actually hear it was participant in first stupid, or second stupid hackathon ever. Incredible project. Um, maybe you could talk about it. Um, so this stupid hackathon, stupid shit no one needs and terrible ideas hackathon has now become a global phenomenon. You can go to almost any city in the world. They have them in, in Indonesia, in Hawaii, in Alaska, in Berlin, in Denmark, in South Africa. And I was just at one in San Francisco that I didn't plan and I just walked into and I got to say, hi, this is so cool. And they're like, oh, this is so cool. We don't know who founded this. And I was like, I did. It was really fun. So they're kind of all over the place. And what, what you make is something that is terrible and stupid. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the things that you can make. The one I just saw in San Francisco, I was telling JS, someone made a computer that if it doesn't compile, it exploded, and it actually exploded. And they had a baby that was the judge, and the baby liked that one the best of the one. Um, which I wish I had thought of that. I wish I had thought of all those ideas, but I didn't. I just thought of the hackathon. I bring stupid and terrible things into the world. Um, this is a piece I made. It's self-explanatory. It's a device that allows users to quickly exit a conversation. That's awkward. <laughs> I gotta go. So, there you go. Um, yep. uh, this is a USB drive that's the size of a floppy disk. You can't even fit an image on it. <laughs> holding it out there. <laughs> so yeah, all these guys. Um, that's a good one. This is a non, it's a ad, non ad blocker. So anything that isn't an ad, it blocks. It's a Chrome extension. It's really useful. We have to use Chrome. Uh, this is a game that uses uh, machine vision to track your eyeballs, and you have to play Pong, but you can't look at the screen. So you have to control it by not looking at it. Very easy to play. Um, this is a wi human Wi-Fi absorption. Turns out five people, and you're, you're good. No more internet. <laughs> End the internet. Um, Soylent for women, it's twice the price for pink. So that's a good one. Uh, Godotify, forever. <laughs> Um, this is a good one. It's, uh, you know, 3D printers, uh, future of automation in our homes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, and they have brought them down too, which is pretty fair. Right? It has like this online app. Um, this is uh, Nicole He, who just left uh, the Google Design Lab to create her own uh, game design company. So if you like this from Nicole, uh, you could hire her. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Good job. Nicole. <laughs> 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 not good at all. Um, so this one is, you know, they have telepresence robots. You don't need a robot. You can get a telepresent rando. And you can just strap an iPad on their face and they can see you and go to meetings for you. Um, one of my favorite ones from the first figure have on. Um, this is out cognito mode, and it just tweets everything you do on the internet. <laughs> That's literally it. Um, so it's stupid hack fun. You can join one. I found out from Googling on my way here that there have been three at MIT. I'm so mad. I always wanted to go to one at MIT. I always wanted to do one at MIT, and like literally it's happened three times already. I don't know. But next one, please invite me. And I don't even know. I don't even know. It's great. It's a totally decentralized network, so anyone can start them. Anyone can do them. Um, people have tried to take it over, which is also really funny because you, you know no one can control stupid. Um, anyways, yeah. So another strategy: get to the heart, playful. So um, this is uh, Alicia Rayner right here, and her friend Christina Hendricks. Um, Alicia Rayner, uh, there she is as well. 
Um, she is a producer of a film called Egg, and uh, of this great like sort of playwright wrote it, and she it, she plays an artist who invites her best friend Christina Hendricks over to the house and shows her her art studio. This is one of the parts of the plot, and she shows Christina Hendricks a VR piece that she made that's like super feminist and weirdo. And so she hired me to make this VR piece that's super feminist and weirdo because obviously I'm really good at weird and stupid. And she said, it'd be really cool because we'll have it in the film and they'll like show it in the film. But then also it should be a real thing that like at film festivals, people can then do the thing from the film. And it'll be like weird and feminist and cyber futurist and wacko. And I was like, oh, 100% I'm on this, like obviously. So I made this piece called Your Hands Are Feet. And it actually ended up with, sorry, because imagine if your hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we had actually won this 100K Gadget Alternative Realities Prize, which was the last thing that Engadget did with their founding editor in chief, my BFF, Chris Trout, who I didn't know at the time, but now we live both in Oakland and we're like BFFs. It's amazing. But it was the last thing he did before they canned him, and now it's just this kind of like corporate thing, which is really sad. But at one time, he was a weirdo. And he, his dream was always to create a prize for VR. What a crazy dream. He had it for like 15 years. So I won it and I got to become friends with him. And then he created this whole experience in LA at that theater at the Ace Hotel. And it was like this whole installation and blah, blah, And it was like the film and it was the VR piece. Anyways, he made this great film about it. So I'm going to show you Chris Trout's film about my work. Yes. <laughs> that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we are like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. Perfect. kind of my creative career as a writer and I was I was really interested in kind of experimental writing that leveraged different um, aspects of new technologies so I got to this point where I was like it's really fun to think about technology and how it's impacting us but I would really rather be working directly with the technologies I went to a grad program called ITP and I learned how to code in my last year of grad school VR suddenly came onto the scene as like something that was going to be accessible for us to use Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors so I can say like I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like wow this is such a strange feeling it kind of reminds me of for instance like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know I feel like my mind is a confusing machine what we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment, so I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from, you know, a half 
and curtain and how we would move from each each space. Landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process. You know, you have to make something that feels true to something that you like, but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes. Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky, in LA, who was an uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and, you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we going to put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense, like, for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not, like, depressing or scary but just a little bit scary maybe it's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent so we were like let's try this tool medium which is a 3d um, vr sculpting tool and so we felt like oh this is perfect that we found this this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in, in a way that we could produce it in a really organic and fun way and that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now <laughs> A lot of our music is going to be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, Oh, it's like an experience where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before? Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also. <laughs> really into the b-roll of new york city <laughs> 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 I was like, okay, guys. um yeah but i think the weirdest thing about that project was i would have people that would experience it and then i would see them like at a film festival or at the the engadget experience or you know wherever and then later i'd run into them and they'd be like oh yeah this conversation reminds me i had this dream actually where and they start describing my vr experience and then they would say, wait a minute, no, you were there. You were in my dream. No, wait, wait a minute. But that was your VR piece. And I thought, that's fascinating that the same way we remember, like moving when you're not moving, uh, walking when you're not walking, you know, doing something when you're not doing something, it's very similar to a dream, right? Like when you're in VR, it's very similar to a dream state because I'm like making something without touching, I'm touching without touching, I'm being with someone without being in the same room as that. It's kind of interesting. So I liked that people, it happened not once, but many times. Cause you know, when you show your VR pieces at film festivals, it's like hundreds of people are going through it. And they're all telling you these things. And then at the next film festival, it's the same, maybe the same people and you're having these conversations. So I heard that so many times that I thought, I wish I was doing some incredible longitudinal study about dreaming in VR, but just from anecdotal information, I love that, that people said like, oh yeah, you were in my dream too. And I said, that's exactly what I like about VR is the ability to really put someone in your dream too. And then someone else can do it. And you both could say, hey, remember when we both had that dream together? That's pretty awesome. I, I love VR for that reason. Anyways, um, dreaming. 
get to the heart. This is the piece that I made with uh, Wendy Redstar. So Google gave us this research camera, the um, E Halo 2. It's in the audience. It's a halo. I'm going to get it. <laughs> Anyways, um, and then <laughs> and it was a 360 video camera. And this is Wendy. And we went to uh, the Red Star Ranch, which is on her reservation in Montana, outside of Billing in um, on Red Star Ranch. Like that's that's the location. And we dragged this this damn thing all the way up these snowy mountains. And we had this goal of recording spaces where this, um, we wanted to make two part, pro parts of this project, one on her reservation and one in the ancestral homeland of my people. She's Crow and she's River Crow. And we both have these things called the little people in our cultures. And they're slightly different, but they're the same in the sense that they're like unknown, possibly very scary and also benevolent and nice. And that's about all we like knew of them. We were like, oh, we're gonna record these locations of where they've been historically known to be from or inhabit or their spaces. And then we're gonna make these cool animations in, in 3D and have like, like 360 video. This is gonna be our project, it's gonna be called Monsters. However, as we started traveling to all of these locations where the little people were, um, we had in incredible strange artifacts that happened to our <laughs> cameras and like really strange things started happening so then we were like we need to meet with the elders and kind of talk a little bit about like maybe we should have just like started with that which we should definitely know better but like eh, everyone makes it safe. so then we met with all the elders and we we're like can you tell us a little bit more about these like little people and they said they said to us the name in crow and they said actually that means keepers of the land and an interesting thing that they do is they frequently like sabotage projects mm -hmm. in order to keep these lands and sites sacred and um, the people who were telling us all this information were actually people that then we said, oh, well, how do you know this information? And they said, well, um, actually, when I was working on preserving the land for X, Y, and Z, that's when I just, so they started telling us how they found out about the story of little people. But by telling us that, they had chronicled all the different ways in which they had saved and preserved the entire reservation. They actually were the champions. They were actually the keepers of the land, right? Like these people that we were talking to were the little people, not just the people that the little people that they had the information of the little people, they were actually embodying that message of keeping and maintaining this land in the hands of her family members and ancestors. And so we were like, man, I don't think this piece is about animated little people. This is actually about like you making a choice. Like are you a keeper of this land or not? And so we created um, an installation at, at um Newark and then it's now at ASU in Phoenix. So we this is actually a sweat lodge. If you've ever seen a sweat lodge on a reservation, that's what they look like. It's like you throw all your Pendletons and any kind of blanket you have in your house and you just like throw it up on the wigwam structure and then you make it really hot and that's how you have an experience. And they look like that. They're like pretty differently aesthetic, I would say, you know, just kind of like kind of haphazard in there. And then on the inside is actually the projection of our, um, of our landscape and our journey through that space. And a couple of times there are these two dogs that adopted us and followed us everywhere we went. And you see them kind of run through at certain times and it almost feels like they're in that center space because you see them kind of like come around and then it feels really odd inside that space. Um, and Wendy loved going inside, that's Wendy, and she loved going inside and people would come into the space. This is her um, retrospective at the New York Museum. And people would come and then go in there and find her and she would just start telling them stories about our experience of finding the little people, but then she just started telling stories, you know, just about all of her work, and it ended up kind of being like a blanket fort where you had stories of this amazing, like, projection, which I always wanted when I was a kid. Like, I always wanted inside my blanket fort to, like, see the sky under there or something. So I, I was, like, for me, something really pleasurable. Even if you didn't know what a sweat lodge was, I think a lot of people were like, oh, it's a blanket fort, and inside I see the outside. I always wanted to see that, and it's just, like, very fun. Um, whether you understood the, um, the like what it's supposed to look like, and then she also took these synthetic like fake astroturf and this like fake all of this is like where the everything is like these really like kind of kitschy, funny, fake objects around, which made it also feel very like a toy or like a play or inside some kind of like dollhouse, but like maybe a dog's me and Wendy would get. So, um, so that's this piece, and it's still up at um, at Arizona State University. Forever in Arizona. <laughs> you can go and see it there. 
Um, and then the next part of it will be doing a similar one um, about the little people of my um, culture as well. So I will be a fun project. Um, so you as a kid, I love thinking about things I would like to experience as a kid because it turns out a lot of other people enjoy those same things. Um, I really like blanket boards. I really like clubs. <laughs> I like treehouse clubs, secret clubs. Um, I created a secret club, but it wasn't so secret. I created an innovation lab um, in New York City, and I just had all of my best friends come and create weirdo things um, with AI because we were all AI nerds. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that first film that was generated in AI Sunspring, so that came out of my lab. This is a way of using all Photoshop algorithms like blur and Gaussian blur, but on text through using like T-SNE and Char Arnon and you know all that kind of stuff. So you kind of like move through three-dimensional space, but semantic space, right? Um, this is a project by Gene Kogan called uh, Machine Learning for Artists, ML ml4a.com um, and it's now all in p5.js so all of his machine learning libraries but for visual uh, components and for artists are all in p5.js which is really cool so it's kind of for even very beginner coders can kind of get started with machine learning which is fun for like artistic projects this is the humans of simulated New York um, this was a Neural network in VR, so you can actually like walk through a, a neural, a, like a, 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 a like, uh, what do you call it? What was that? Cycle? Yeah, well, you could like walk through the steps of um, a. Back propagation. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? <laughs> For like character recognition, right? For like hand drawn character recognition. So you could go and you could draw. And then in the beginning, you would like draw with your finger, and then you could like actually walk through the steps of how it's detecting the edges and deciding like what character you just drew, right? So it's like very kind of well-known um, neural network, but you could actually like kind of visualize it through walking through it and walking around it, which kind of changes the way you understand it, or changes the way I understood it. And then this is a project with Aaron Arts. He is the pianist for a band called Beirut and also Grizzly Bear, and he created sheet music that was generated um, through like lily pad sound files of Bach and then performed it with his band, which was really fun. So this was like my clubhouse experience, hanging out with my friends. Um, yeah. And then also, I was really, you know, I've always been really interested in like building cities either out of cardboard or SimCity. Obviously, if I was younger, I'd be into Minecraft. It's really cool. I don't know how to play it though because I'm old. Um, it looks cool. My son's really good at it. I love Legos. And um, I had someone come to me when I was in my clubhouse with my AI friends, and they were like, Do you look like you're having a lot of fun? I'm like, I'm having the best time in my life. And they were like, Well, if you could do anything else, what would you do? I'm like, Nothing else. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> never do anything again in my life. And they're like, Well, should that ever wrap up this amazing time you're having? what would you like to do? It's kind of like, I always hoped a man in a bow tie and a business suit, kind of like the devil with a suitcase, would come and ask me this question, and he did. Such a great man, named Ralph DeBart, he's a city planner from New York, he's built the communities, like the artistic communities of Chelsea, Soho, uh, Beacon, other places like this, he like kind of creates these cities that are around cultural production and art. So he's like, well, what about building a city? And I was like, well, that is kind of as cool as making AI. Maybe cooler. I don't know. I've never made a city. No one's ever asked me if I wanted to, actually. But I really do want to now that I think about it. So yes, I would like to build a city with you. So I said, great. I'm the head of the business improvement district in New Rochelle, which is just above the Bronx in New York. And what if you could make a city for like your friends of your clubhouse, what would it be? And I said, well, actually, I think it might be interesting because, you know, what we do in AI, we can kind of do from anywhere. We can be digital nomads. We can just connect through laptops. We don't even need a physical space. But in order to make VR and motion capture, we actually need, like, really high-powered machines that not all of us have access to. And we also need some specialized equipment that not all of us have access to. Should we actually need a lab for that? So I decided, we decided to create, or I created this thing called Idea in Your Shell. And um, it was uh, a, a city that's dedicated to um, connecting people who are working around VR and AR and XR. And we had a residency above a train station, a live work residency with a lab, and it had like different types of equipment and mocap and all that kind of stuff. 
And then in order to continue its funding, um, we entered this Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge. And um, my idea was to create a citizen toolkit so citizens could co-design their cities in VR and AR with city planners and with other stakeholders. And we won, which was really fun. Um, and this is, this is a little comic that Tony Patrick actually helped us, you know, he designed it, worked with his artists um, about teaching the citizens like what VR is and how, how they can use it. And then these are some of our charrettes with, with citizens where we had them, you know, testing out our different prototypes and giving us feedback and helping us iterate so that we could create a good way for them to give feedback to their city planners and have the city planners also um, had a photo of the mayor in there too, but like had everyone kind of go into this process and create a, a co-creation project around that. Um, yeah, so that's that's my what's led me here. Um, it, a year ago this week, um, I went to Dharmshala, India, where I met um, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. That's the whole time. Um, and he talked a lot about the technologies that existed in India before our colonization, about the wealth of scientific research they had around mind-body connection, around uh, you know, neuroscience, and he said it was just so many you know, hundreds of years or even thousands of years more advanced than the colonists who ended up destroying all of this information. And he said it was just, it's, it's a great loss, but yet most of this information still is exists in oral histories through either the ethnic people of Tibet or other um, you know, different ethnic groups in India. And he just kind of talked about this as being like such a great loss that we had so much data and it was all lost because of its, you know, either it wasn't useful for colonization or it just wasn't understood or, you know, forever, for all the different reasons it was destroyed. And I was presenting to him work, um, you know, around VR if they wanted to use VR to help um, people outside of the Tibet region be able to understand their sacred places, their temples, their even the palace that he grew up in in Tibet, um, as well as talking about the antecedent technology of my people. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I'm hoping to do here at MIT with Cap. Um, so antecedent technology, I'm going to talk about that a little bit right now. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm gonna read my little statement. <laughs> All right, if history was written by the vectors, then the future, or oh, sorry, let me get my thing set up here. Start again. If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if that'll be positive or negative. It is said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, and I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as the basis of the United States government, and they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy, which is my tribe Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora nations, independent nations. Thomas Jefferson spent a year with us, the Iroquois in upstate New York, in one of our large cities, um, which was a large, sizable portion of the United States and Canada. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founders drafted the Constitution, they cherry-picked the parts that were most beneficial to their political purposes, the bits that seemed to align best with their Enlightenment-era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. What did they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, the women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones that could vote. And the representative was always a man, was the chief. There was a balance of power, only men could serve, but only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of col colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect that it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or a lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gendered lines or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or imagine a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sustainable practices. We all have colonial mindset, no matter who we are, just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing. We are not colonial subjects. We don't live under colonial empire anymore. 
In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias but low variance, and this is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data or with data that is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting an idea without the context that makes it work in the first place. I'm here to say don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to be to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, then we might have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum, this is my little wampum shell, <laughs> Um, is among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts and it helped us govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've turned, termed an antecedent technology and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predicted predated modern computing by hundreds of years, and actually a Python library to decode Kipu knot tying was invented here at MIT. Um, it was by an undergraduate student too, which is really cool. Um, when we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive, positive change in the world, we don't need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream of our future. And I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here where I'm standing today. So, um, that is my little statement that I read. Um, and I'm working on a project here called wampum.codes. Um, and I want to show you, I showed you the little shell. Um, it's a little shell and a big idea. I've been also kind of recreating the wampum beads in uh, VR and as digital pieces as well. So this is what our great law of peace was recorded in wampum as. And this is, each of these squares symbolizes our, like this is the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, Tuscarora joined later, so they're not on the Constitution. But they, it, the reason that it extends to the end is because anyone can join our Confederacy. And then we have this complex system of democracy around it. And these belts, this is an example of the six chiefs in Brantford, Canada, explaining how their, how their wampum belts work. And there's usually someone that is the carrier of the belts, not just because they've been designated to be a leader or a chief, but because they're an interpreter and understand the history and also the ways in which the laws are applied. You can kind of think of them like a lawyer, right? They're like, I, I've like read the law, I can be interpreted this way in this case, I can make exception in that case. And they kind of are the one that holds all this information that's recorded in the belts. So you have this kind of proof, like a contract, but then you also, besides a contract, you kind of need somebody that can interpret it into real world situations. Um, and then, you know, George Washington took us at our word, and this is a belt that he created. Mm. And he, he did the thing where he extended it to the 13 colonies. And these represent the white colonists who then, then they took a draft of our constitution and created the US constitution based on that. Mm. And this is, was something that then he gave to uh, the Onondaga, who are that center tree in the middle of our great law of peace to confirm that they were now not only just a part of our confederacy, but they had created a confederacy after our own. Um, yeah. So, um, so part of what my project is, I like to use um, metaphors, um, technological metaphors, because I'm a nerd and software developer and that's the world I live in, but I like to think about it as, you know, the source code of the constitution last thousands of years, and then there was a fork made, and they missed some of our dependencies. And things have been gone totally as planned. And I would like to say that there's a little bit of malware in our constitution. It's time to roll back changes and do a software update and try again. And I, I'm hoping with this project of connecting with women in my 
um, tribe. I have a core of eight women who use technology in their projects, either as data scientists or um, in environmental scientists, filmmakers, VR directors, um, and other types of you know, storytellers and technologists. Um, to think about what that would look like. What is the software update of this constitution? You know, you don't always get it right the first time. That's why I reiterate. So um, that's going to be really the project, and they'll be coming to MIT for the convening of the Indigenous Peoples Convening in April. So I hope that you guys can come and, and hear us talk and become part of the conversation on um, this, uh, this project led by the Indigenous Women of my tribe. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? So first, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, inspiring stuff. I'm interested in the you, it, near the end. You started to talk about the the interpretation of the of the wampum. And it, is there anything that that's like? Let's say in Western culture, is it like interpreting your horoscope, or is it like interpreting a, what a lawyer would do with the Constitution? How fixed is the text? How much intersubjectivity is is there? Would a lot of people kind of see the same thing if they were literate? Or would it be pretty open, like the horoscope side of things? Well, I think it's it's much more similar to constitutional law, where you know there's a lot of leeway. <laughs> like, I mean, of you know, like, or even any kind of like lawyer would tell you, like, well, it depends on the situation. And so it's that. I bet it, it's it's more similar to that, where it takes an enormous amount of training and expertise, but it's not random, right? It's not like you could just read it any which way. And a group of lawyers could come to an agreement, but then lawyers also love to argue. So there's you know, that part too. Um, but the person who's the keeper of the wampum and the interpreter has, again, had that lengthy training and has also been given that designation by the tribe. It's like, no, you're, they're good at this, you know the proper information, you'll, you'll respect and represent our interests. Um, because a lot of times that person may accompany a chief who's saying, hey, these are all of our agreements, I want to renegotiate, or you know, whatever kind of thing needs to happen. And then that person can kind of say, well, yeah, this is, this is how we arrived here, and this is how we will move forward, and our contracts were a record of um, you know, public discourse that had reached a consensus among chiefs, but also among community members, and so it really is that kind of record, but it's in a much more decentralized way than the law being like one central government. It really is like these, um, these records of, of treaties and interactions and contracts. You were going so quickly. Uh, so what happens in April exactly? Oh, yeah. You are iterating your project with your eight participants, and you will present. Can you just say some, a little more about yeah. the plans? So I, I, have, I would like each of them to be able to talk about how they would like to prototype different ways that we can interact with our democracy. Um, one of the ways that I am participating in the project is I would like to create a value-based dependency project for software developers um, so that we can encode and make explicit sort of the same way we do with Wampum in our code by saying these are the values that I expect are needed to maintain this code. It's not just what I believe and other people should believe in order to use the code, but actually without the societal belief or without this value system, the whole project doesn't actually even hold up. So it's a true dependency in that way. So I'm creating that. But then another woman who's part of my group is creating a VR intervention project for suicide on reservations. And another woman's working with mapping and water systems. So they all have kind of different prototypes. And then they'll talk about how those would contribute to um, like a software update kit for the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that will happen in April, which you know, mm -hmm. Kat can maybe talk about that if you want to. Or we might, it might be TBD. And, we can talk a little bit about it. It's, um, we've got a, a partnership with, this is not public yet, but I'm trusting that, well, actually we have a camera rolling. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll be a little bit more general. Um, uh, we have um, uh, three, two or three days um, uh, gathering uh, here at MIT with an indigenous delegation of scholars and artists that will come and meet with um, uh, scholars and artists here at MIT and talk about AI and digital, the digital sphere. Um, and we're thrilled that uh, one of our, our key key projects that will kind of be part of the be beating is uh, Wampum.codes and Amelia mm -hmm. will be, be prototyping and um, sharing her work with that delegation. Right. I 
Thanks so much for the talk. Um, we were, when we were talking the other day, there was a moment in our conversation that I thought was really interesting where you were talking about how people um, were approaching you to kind of constantly ask you about you know, how to scale um, and we sort of went back and forth about what it means to resist that constant imperative to like scale up projects and can you reach a million users and all that. So I wonder if you could, um, could you share a little bit of the way that you think about that and how you, how you approach that in, in your work? Yeah, thank you so much. We had such a great conversation. Like that. Um, thank you for that, too. Um, yeah, I, a lot of people have said, that's great. You know, once you have this model, then I know this indigenous person in New Zealand or in Australia or this person in this group and that. I'm like, okay, now it can be like everybody around the world is doing your same system to prototype, like, update constitution and our connection to democracy. But, um, yeah, I'm starting with eight women from my specific tribe. Um, because I have no idea how to fix the problems of every, every single person in the world, but all the diverse types of governments that we interact with, and also um, there is pan-indigenous solidarity, but that doesn't mean that we are facing the same issues in every place or have even the same things top of mind. There's a lot of, you know, obviously very complex, complex legal structures that we're fighting against. It's very different from even the U.S. and Canada, and my tribe is bisected by both, so even my Canadian cousins are dealing with very different legal s structures than my own, and so I'm working primarily with just a core group of, um, of people from my tribe first and see if, if we can you know get it right and what kind of things we have to say and make sure that's really solid before we like extend the ends of our constitution out to other people um, and really try to train and, and, and ways to connect. So I don't, I, I, I really love that you brought that up because I, I don't want to be a person that's saying like, this is a solution for all indigenous people and a template, like a templated structure and it can just generate 5,000 websites that'll blah, blah, you know, like it's not a static site generator for, you know, democracy, but I hope that it can show at least, it can maybe inspire other people to do something maybe radically different, but at least hope building and world building is some kind of muscle that I have to use every day or else I succumb to uh, real negative thinking about our democracy and about our constitution. If I don't do something every day that I find hope in, um, I don't have the energy anymore to keep dreaming of new things. Mm -hmm. It's personal conservation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was just, um, as you were talking, I was realizing I'd done a project on constitution in Canada last, oh, cool. last year, but it's called Supreme Law. Um, but it, it's interesting because a lot of the constitutional scholars, including indigenous uh, scholars that I talked to, um, talked about the difference between Canadian constitution and American constitution where, you, and it's this whole reading of the, of the constitution is very fixed in America. It's like, well, what was written then, that is forever good, and, and you're, you're suggesting it's not, of yeah. course. And um, in, in Canada, there's a, lot, there's a big argument for the, the constitution as a living tree. That's and that right. using that metaphor as, a, you know, it's, it's something that continues to grow and adapt to, yeah. to the future, but what your project is doing is also saying it's, we've already had that. Yeah. Well, and, and that that belt that um, that George Washington gave to the Onondaga, um, it has a tree. It has a house in the middle, mm. and ours has a tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is interesting, right? Like government is a building, and we are like government is, is a tree. And the reason it's a tree is because when we all agreed to stop fighting one another, we buried all of our weapons underneath um, the sacred white pine. And so that symbolizes like peace for us. But um, but that this belt actually exists in Canada now. It's at the Onondaga Reservation, so that's in Canada. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, I I went to my undergraduate degree at George Mason, which everyone like loves to poke. I mean, and I too poke fun of it because it's kind of like the center for libertarians. Right. And it's the center for constitutional law. And so every single one of my friends, while I was like making VR and weird tech, multimedia things, all the things I was talking about in my lunches and everything were all people who are constitutional 
law scholars and specifically libertarians, and they definitely don't believe in a fixed. You know, it's like very much a living constitution and ha having these conversations, and they're like young, right? Like we're all like kids, we're like 21. So having a 21 year old constantly pontificate, oh, I think the constitution is blah, blah, blah. And this was just like normal every day. There's, oh God, it's John again, it's going on. Oh, Kevin's going on. But then Amelia will be like, well, I'll take it. I'm not like a lawyer, but I would just engage in these conversations. And it seemed like if people as dumb as all of us could have these conversations, and then they all went on to like, you know, do really important things and all work in the White House and Senate and Congress and everything. I'm like, any of us can have these conversations. I mean, you don't need a, a degree or a law degree to have these conversations. Their ideas weren't in any way special, but we did have this concept that like, yeah, we're all supposed to be having these arguments and conversations constantly. We're allowed to. But I realized that it's true as I talk about this to other people, there's not, not everyone feels like they have, like I'm not a lawyer, but I feel like I can talk about these things, even if I say silly things, even if I'm wrong or right, like I'm allowed to have an opinion, I guess is what I'm saying, right? Um, so I'm hoping that with this project, it's just giving a space for like, you can at least see the indigenous women of my tribe, like what's their opinion? And then I hope that it, if nothing else, it gives people that permission to be like, I have an opinion, this is how I would imagine things. Because if we can't imagine things being any different, we're definitely not going to ever get that. So. Must have had this imagination uh, evolution for a reason. So just just to the slide, I mean, is there much like this? These these endeavors from the the kind of Anglo-American power structure to speak in the language of the of the, of the native. I, I mean, or is this just a, the symbol that we've? I don't know if you you know met. I probably a lot of people here have met native people. We're like exceptionally proud of our own culture. So like I know everything about the Iroquois, but I not claim to know anything about like the crow but then wendy like my best friend from the last piece she would be like i don't know anything about those iroquois they're always like constitution blah 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 nonsense <laughs> look at how amazing our stuff is and she'll talk about like she knows all the history and like maybe people were just like really proud and we're kind of like self-centered you know and so i only know like the iroquois like connection to the u.s government but then wendy if she was up here she'd be like look we kicked Custer's ass, and that changed everything in the U.S. So she has a very crow-centered view of like what's going on in the U.S. So like I, I can't speak for anyone with my tribe just because like we, we don't even care. You know? <laughs> no, I mean I care. I just like you know like really self. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I think it is. I mean, it's fascinating to us because we have so much documentation because we connected. We connected to the U.S. government at its inception, and so they wrote a lot about us, which is, I'm grateful for, because as someone of my tribe, we just have so much information about those early years written down in paintings and writings and declarations and the belts that they gave in our language to us, all that kind of stuff we got early on, because it was before they decided to like eradicate all of us. Um, you know, so it was like we have all this interesting kind of treasure trove of that exchange, and I'm sure it has happened all over Canada and the U.S. in other ways, but this was a unique moment in time when we were really truly at peace with each other. It's, it was special. Just talk a little bit about, um, is there a particular challenge in making something like Wampum, which has this really, it's very like tactile, right? And then what happens when you're translating that into a VR space where you're not yeah. Is that yeah. a particular problem? Um, I mean, I don't... This piece that I made here, I was telling Kat about it. I I wanted... I used to beat all the time just as, you know, like, I grew up beating. Beating is really fun. If you know how to do it, it, like, it just is really... It's very meditative. It's like knitting or something. You're just, like, doing it. It's really fun. And I used to do it all the time, like, on the train, on the plane, everywhere. But then after, you know, like different plane regulations came in, you couldn't use my scissors anymore, or my really long needles, or all these things that like couldn't bring on planes anymore. And I miss beading everywhere. Even though like every time there's turbulence, beads are like flying everywhere. And I was just like, oh my God, but it was fine. You know, I did it everywhere. I bring it as a kid, you know, be beading all the time. And you also have like a shelf life on beading. Like every native person will tell you like once you hit 40, it's like, because you go cross-eyed from it. And so after a while, your eyes just start like, Stop. And so you get five vocals and you keep going, but there's a certain point where your body just like tells you to quit because it's like, and then you teach other people how to do it because it's like, you know. But I wasn't able to do it anymore and I love beating, and so I started using my phone 
And I started doing all of our same beadwork patterns in these 3D models I could make on my phone. And then I was asked by Mia, which is this big museum in Minneapolis, kind of like the Met in New York. It's this very old, 100-year-old, massive space. And they were doing this large, like, 50 artists who are Native women, a survey of their work. And they asked me to do something. And I was like, I don't know. All I've been doing is these, like, stupid beads. You know, I just, like, really want to be just kind of like, it's like a craft. It's not even art. It's just something I have to, like, do to keep my mind off. I hate flying. Um, they said, well, let me see some. They, they creeped on my Instagram and they saw them and they were like, we want to show them. I'm like, well, there's nothing to show. It's just Instagram. It's not like a thing to show. And they're like, well, can you make it into a thing to show? So I did. I made this like animation of my beads. They're like 3D beads. But beads are already 3D. I don't know why I said 3D. <laughs> <laughs> also, we make raised beadwork, so our beads like go out like this. So we already make 3D beads. So I don't know why I call that, but you know. So we put all these like 4K screens on this grid, and then it was at the Mia. Now it's at um, the Frist in Nashville, and so you can. It's a touring show, and hopefully it will come. It, they're thinking of maybe bringing it to the Peabody Essex. So I don't know. Maybe it'll, I'll let you guys know if it comes to town. But um, yeah, I just kind of made this dumb animation from the beads, but I, I still love making them. It's just so tactile. I just use my fingers and stretch and mold and you know make this kind of thing with a, like three different stupid apps it's like my version of like this craft I can't do on the go anymore um, but I don't know it's fun to do our crafts and it's fun to do them in new technologies and I don't think there's I love when I see other people doing their sort of traditional crafts in the new media because it's it's fun Going, going. <laughs> Does anyone have a stupid idea? Stupid <laughs> idea. <laughs> That's the best thing about running the stupid hackathon is the whole year people come up to me and be like, I have the stupidest idea. And I'm like, oh my god, you're going to tell me this is great. And then they tell me stupid ideas. So. Um, JS, do you want to tell the stupid hackathon project you made at the second stupid hackathon? Uh, <laughs> okay. Sorry. If I remember correctly, it was um, a crowdfunding project to get um, to get like a McDonald's franchise to put it into a church or something along <laughs> yeah. something along yeah. those. And then you also had Gen Do you want to talk about that one? Oh, you yeah. You didn't make it there, but it was like um, that. That one was <laughs> oh man, really, really. Pushing back my memory. No, no, no. I'll, I'll but, just uh, pitch it because I remember. Oh, yeah. Like, of yeah. course, I remember yeah, all yeah. of these. Yeah. Look at Chance. So Jay, Jay has made a lot of really great projects for the Hackathon. But I really love Gen Coin, which was uh, gen meat, meat that is made in a lab, not from an animal, but it's made out of celebrities. <laughs> and then it's on the blockchain, so you can tell like which it's like verified. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> just like yes, yes. Yep. Yes, um, That was a great project. It was great to um, celebrity me. <laughs> and it's sort of vegetarian-ish. Yeah. Vegan. Vegan. Depends if the celebrity is vegan. Anyone else have a stupid idea? Um, I'm sure there'll be another stupid hack at MIT very soon because they've done so three RFAs, so um, happy to come back for the next one. You know about it before I do. Um, yeah. Does yeah. so anyone need any advice? Anyone have any issue with our static site generators? <laughs> Gatsby, what's that about? I don't know. I can talk about a lot. Any questions? You want to be really good at React because I have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> your, uh, your, product, uh, your project about giving um, intention to code or like um, yeah. value to code, uh, how would that, uh, do you have any you know, ideas at this point about how you will sort of, what you will end up with? Like, so, that I'm interested in using. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, like, I really like the process when you're making your package.json on whatever 
you know, app that you're making. It kind of, it goes, you go through these steps in your CLI tool that's like, oh, do I need this, do I need that? Great, 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 great. And then it'll be like, do you want a license? And you're like, yes, what's available? And it's like, well, you know, you have GNU, you have MIT. And then, you know, like all of us are very used to these things, but then I started thinking about it. That's like the only value-based decision I make in my, at that moment, in my package that I based on. Um, and it's somewhat philosophical, and I make it pretty quickly, because I understand what both those things are, and I'm like, I was before, so I just like do it, and I thought, what if it was instead like, oh, well, value-based dependency, and then I got to kind of templatize and build it based off of my GitHub repo that would have like, oh, this is Amelia's general one, and then here's, JS is forked one that has in addition to some vegan properties around celebrity <laughs> and forked that. So, you know, so I can kind of say like this, this repo, this fork is what is connected to this dependency, right? In the same way we do all the, a lot of dependencies that are you know, based in that way. So, um, and there are interesting people doing different things with either licenses or dependencies in, that I've been, you know, just kind of around MozFest or the kind of groups that we have in our circles. Because there's different interesting ways, and when it comes to enforcement, there's also different interesting ways that I've seen people do. Some of it's like tokens and verification, right? Where you can kind of have something like even as simplified as like sim simple as when we you know, deploy things, you can kind of have tokens that show you the status of of like your site. You can have a similar thing that connects to that repo. That if it's if it's maintained and if it's active and if it's valid, then you have this token. And if should you not have that token be green anymore, then like okay, it's been a month since you've been verified, it looks like you're not in fact. Um, so, but, but it is an issue of enforcement, and I think having something that's enforced by a community and by community standards rather than it be by, like, with the MIT license of the new, it's really like I would have to sue someone if I wanted to go after them. I could talk to them, too. I could say, you're not, you're closed sourcing my open source, but you might probably just go to a lawyer because it's written in legal language so that you can go to a lawyer so it can be uh, adjudicated by it. The law, but I think I would like to have it be something that is by the community, for the community, enforced by the community. But of course, it is a complex process, and so what I'm creating would probably be at best a prototype to talk about these issues and why we need to make values explicit in projects. And it's not just I want everyone to share my values of this software project, it's actually there's just implicit things that I kind of assume people will think about, but I should make those explicit um, because what we think of in in our culture is seven generations. Anything that I make, it should last for seven generations, and anything I have made is the result of seven generations before me. So I'm in constant communication with my ancestors and my descendants. So how can I communicate seven generations in the future if I'm just assuming they understand the implicit nature of the culture I'm in? That like, oh, they understand what open source means, they understand what like sharing means in these terms. If I make them explicit, it kind of future proofs it in a way, but I also think it can become a model for how we can communicate to other people outside of our community, not just people in the future. And just the pure discussion around what goes in there yeah. will be super interesting. Yeah. And how you can find different things. So much for coming. I really appreciate everyone, their energy and their being and presence. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. <laughs>